Well, hello, everyone. Um, wonderful to see you today here at uh, MoonCon 22. My name is Jenna Tellendrew, and I am so pleased to be with you this afternoon. Um, I have written a few books about uh, two different Celtic goddesses for, um, for Moon Books, one about uh, the goddess Hrianan and one about the goddess Blodioth. And so I thought I'd take this opportunity to talk a little bit about how to connect with, how to enter into devotional relationships with deity. And so uh, although I come from a... Um, Brythonic polytheist background. I uh, work in the Avalonian tradition, but I work with Welsh gods and goddesses. Um, the, the things that I'm going to be talking about are applicable across the board. So no, no matter what um, tradition you're working in or what deities you're drawn to, I think uh, the things I'm going to be talking about will be applicable uh, for you. But just know that that's my background. Um, and so you know, sometimes when I draw upon some examples, it might be, um, you know, Welsh Celtic specific, but uh, I'll try to make it as broad as possible. Uh, as we go, I will be um, pausing every so often to ask if anyone has any questions. And um, lovely Rachel has said that she would put them up on the uh, on the screen for me. So uh, hopefully we'll have a nice interaction going today. So thank you so much for your attention. And then we'll start. I have a nice... Um, this will slide deck to share with you. If I can get it to work. Here we go. So one of the things I think that a lot of people um, encounter when they perhaps are first starting on a, a pagan path, especially if they've been um, in other religions in the past and they've switched over Christianity, uh, especially there is a sense that um, our connection with the divine has shifted to being a personal one, to uh, us able to make and maintain a direct connection to the gods, as opposed to having, you know, a priest or a pastor or uh, someone else as an intermediary. And so that's very empowering. And I think a lot of people are drawn to that. Um, but I think if you are working alone or, um, you know, your community is not a uh, local to you, or if you're gathering and there's no specific tradition, or even if you're just um, interested in walking a solitary path, it can be perhaps um, being thrown into an ocean without much direction. How do we make these connections to the gods? How do we foster these relationships? And so that's what I want to talk about today. And even if you're not a beginner, even if this isn't your first um, time or, you know, starting up uh, walking a pagan path, I think that some of the things that I'll be talking about uh, will help uh, seasoned practitioners and people who are in relationship with the divine um, deepen those relationships. Um, so that's the perspective I'm coming from. And, um, and here we go. So how do we begin to make these direct connections? Um, again, I think that when we are connecting with ancient deities, um, there are a lot of different approaches that modern practitioners take. And one of the biggest ones, well, I came into paganism in the mid eighties. <clears throat> so this is before Silver Ravenwolf. This is, um, but, but, but Wicca as a, as a construct, as, as, as a tradition, as a, as a, as a paradigm is probably the most um, prevalent. And so I think a lot of people are used to uh, this neo-Wiccan, or some people call it Wiccanate, Wiccanite, uh, kind of structure for a pagan uh, practice, unless you're working in some of the culturally centered traditions. Um, and so I want to talk about that in terms of uh, this idea that the connections that we make um, what's powerful and what is very efficient and what's going to be, what's the base, what the basis of what I'm going to be talking about here is that um, to approach a divinity, um, meet them where they are, as opposed to having them meet us where we are. What does that mean? That means that, you know, um, if we use that kind of, again, it, and it may not be the case everywhere, but uh, there was a time period where that was kind of the universal kind of pagan practice, kind of the, you know, calling the quarters and drawing a circle and invoking God and goddess and the elements and all of that. And um, and I say neo-Wiccan as opposed to uh, British traditional Wicca uh, is that, um, you know, there's the polarity of God and goddess, but in uh, BTW, uh, 
it's a specific god and a specific goddess, whereas some other kind of more eclectic practices, uh, neo-Wiccan practices, um, they'll bring in gods and goddesses from different pantheons. Um, sometimes I know I've known of groups that every month will work with different divinities from different pantheons. This month it's Egypt, next month it's uh, Mesopotamian, and after that it's Norse. Um, so they're um, having experiences with these different divinities, um, but they're importing them into an operating system that is not native to them, to use that metaphor. And so what I'm suggesting is the idea of coming into relationship with the divine uh, and trying to do so using their native um, mainframe, meeting them where they are, uh, learning about them from that cultural perspective. If we think about the work of the practitioner, of the devotee, of the priest or the priestess, as a person in direct connection, in devotion, we seek to build a bridge. We seek to build an energetic connection between us and the divine. And um, a foundational principle for this is the hermetic principle of, of correspondences, like attract and like. So the more your practice and the more your uh, devotional space and your devotional um, uh, practices are tied into the energies of the god or goddess or goddess multiple divinities that you want to work with, the easier it is to kind of build that bridge, to make that connection, to resonate with them. And so this is uh, this is the perspective uh, that I'm coming from, this culturally specific piece. And I do think that um, doing some work, researching, connecting to a culture of origin of divinities that we feel drawn to work with or that we are currently working with is really a key to understanding them. And that's for several reasons. So we're going to go into them because culture and, and religion, religion as a, a manifestation of culture, are very tied in to each other. And uh, I'll talk about those processes in a second. Um, Another thing to keep in mind is that culture is a practice. It's not a genetic inheritance. And I know that this is a topic that's uh, that comes up a lot. I know in, uh, in, in Celtic uh, pagan <clears throat> communities, there is a sense that, um, you know, people of the diaspora, people, for example, who live in North America, but who are of, say, Scottish or Irish descent and identify as Scottish or Irish, but don't speak the language or, um, you know, ha haven't been immersed in a culture, um, really are very different in uh, their experience of that culture than people who are native to that culture. So it, it, culture isn't passed down through your bloodline. You may have a genetic heritage that connects you to a land, but um, to be involved in culture means to actively partake in practice by learning the language, by learning uh, traditional craft or art, by engaging in cultural studies, historical studies, by traveling there and spending time there. So, um, so, so I just want to make those differentiations. And I think also, you know, on top of all of the pieces with appropriation and, um, you know, making sure that we are, pardon me, um, respectful of living cultures uh, from which the divinities we work with um, arise, uh, that, uh, you know, we, that we listen to those native voices, that we are um, engaging in a way that is respectful, and, um, and that we're listening to, you know, their feelings around these things. There are some ancient uh, pathways that people follow, let's say Mesopotamian, uh, or of course, people are living in those areas now, but the culture itself is no longer really present. So there's less of a pressure, I guess, around that. But I do think still that uh, in, in approaching the divinities of the various cultures in, Med in the Mesopotamian area um, from this cultural perspective is, uh, is still a, a good thing in a, in a powerful way of connecting um, for, for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about. Um, Oh, and the other piece with the genetic inheritance. Um, sometimes that goes down uh, down little uh, little nationalist paths, um, and so you know, just be careful around uh, people and groups that start using those terms because that that can that can run us into some trouble. And I won't say any more about that. Um, like calls to like, like attracts like. So the idea that, for example, if you want to work with Anana and you've done research about her and have collected um, 
ritual tools and uh, offerings and incense and um, imagery and uh, color schemes and things that are connected to her that are culturally um, uh, connected to her, uh, that you're kind of making a little pool of Inanna energy where you are. And that is the kind of thing that um, f fosters and facilitates those connections. Um, and it goes to this idea that intention draws attention. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the difference between feeling called by a divinity and being called to work with a divinity, or perhaps not feeling either of those things. And how do we decide who we're working with or who we want to, um, you know, spend some time in devotion with? Um, so, so, so that's that is another piece of this of this conversation. But I think that um, if you're not feeling that you were actively being called by a divinity, um, one way to call a divinity is to get their attention by doing this work, by putting your energy into uh, this devotional research. Because not only are you learning about the culture and the divinity through their myths and through their symbol sets and all of that, you're also, the, the very energies that you're expending on doing this work, bringing this stuff together, learning these pieces, is a devotional act. And that devotional act is noticed. So there is that piece as well. And then finally, once you've gotten all of these pieces together, a way to enter into a relationship, I've identified three major um, actions. One of them is study, which is all the things that I've kind of touched upon already, putting all those pieces together. The next is practice, taking those pieces and putting them to work, uh, actively seeking connection uh, through various esoteric um, practices, and we'll talk about those. And then finally, through devotion, through mindfulness, through making a heart connection, through every day spending a little bit of time um, in front of your shrine to a divinity, making offerings to them, whether it's offerings of time or offerings of, you know, foodstuffs that they would have been offered in the past or, um, you know, devotional service. Uh, let's say uh, you want to be in a devotional relationship with Epona, perhaps um, doing some work in a, um, in a, in a, in a horse um, rehabilitation stall, uh, doing some volunteer work can be parsed as a devotional service in her honor to make those connections. So these are the major themes of uh, what we'll be talking about and uh, what I have found myself to be um, to be helpful in creating these connections. Because if you're not working in a tradition where there are other people who give you the keys to unlock the doors of making connections with gods or goddesses, uh, how do you begin this process? So this is, um, this is one approach uh, that I have found helpful. And so I want to talk a little bit about why it's so important for us to uh, look to the culture of origin when we want to enter into a devotional relationship. And let me talk about for a second what a devotional relationship is for me. Um, you know, I think that I'll speak from my experience. I know that when I was a child and I was learning about Greek mythology in, in elementary school, you know, you, you get a list of gods and their attributes, right? So there's the goddess of love and the god of war and the god of peace and the god of the underworld and the god of darkness and the, the god of the sun. You know, there's the god of, of travelers and the, um, the goddess of the grain. So they, they seem to be um, very um, regimented, very uh, specific areas of, of, of um, rule that these divinities have. And uh, I know that back in the beginning of the internet, uh, when you looked up any kind of pagan information, you'd get you'd get these deity lists. And so people would, you know, approach um, working with the gods at, like this. I'm going on a journey. I'm going, you know, flying uh, across the ocean. Uh, I want to make offerings to a god of travel. Who, who would I, who would I, work with. Or uh, I have a big test coming up. Uh, who's the god of study? Um, um, I'm trying to get pregnant. What goddess should I work with? So, excuse me, it's very, it was, it's very um, almost transactional 
I talk a lot about the idea of transactional paganism, where you um, enter into relationships that are just about transaction. Um, and, and certainly that is a mode of expression in the ancient world. We see, for example, in, uh, in some of the, uh, the, the Celtic lands, um, you know, goddess uh, shrines at places like uh, in Bath, uh, 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 Sulis Minerva. Um, she is a goddess of healing and then people would go and they'd give, and this is a, it, this is a, um, a, a, a a Roman, uh, a, a, a Celtic Roman kind of uh, fusion of a practice. But, you know, you'd go to the goddess and you'd put in an, a, 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 a request into her waters uh, for healing or even for cursing. And um, with the promise that if you cure me, I will give you this. Or if you curse those people, I will praise you in this way. Or I will erect, um, you know, a... a, a uh, something in your honor. So there's kind of like a, if you do this, then I will do this kind of a, a situation. Um, and that's part of that cultural practice. So I'm not really talking about that, although it's an interesting uh, thing to consider. Um, and there's there was a whole um, system surrounding that. Um, but I think personally, from a modern day perspective, it's, um, it's kind of I find, you know, you wouldn't call somebody randomly uh, in the uh, in the phone book to help ask you to move that you don't know. And so to approach a divinity that you're not in relationship with uh, and ask them a favor for you, even if it's, you know, I'll pour you some mead uh, if you, you know, help me you know, pass this test or do well in this um, uh, legal battle. Um, I, I still think that um, <clears throat> it limits the gods to very almost two specific roles. Um <clears throat> and it's also very kind of, um, you know, they're, they're more like tools, right? And so, again, there are some traditions where that is part of how you interact with them. But I'm trying to differentiate between that and a devotional relationship, one which is a long term, a long standing relationship. Um, I've worked with um, so, um, several goddesses, especially from <clears throat> the Welsh tradition for over 30 years, the same five goddesses. And I have found that what's more important than uh, knowing which, which, you know, sometimes you can look and say, oh, which goddess would be better to go to for this or for that. Um, for me, it's more about <clears throat> who, um, you know, let me put it this way. I have never found uh, an issue uh, that these divinities could not um, give me guidance around. And I think that that, for me, is one of the things about devotional relationships, that it's about um, getting to know each other. It's about um, being in connection and contact. It's about going and giving out of uh, abundance, out of interest, out of, um, out of respect, out of honor, uh, meeting with them in ritual, meeting with them in journey, in journey giving them um, an offerings without um, any strings attached. It's just pure devotion, and, it, and it's about being in connection. So... Um, that said, um, where do gods come from, right? Why, why, why is it so important for us to, um, to talk about things from a cultural perspective? Um, and maybe I'll just pause for a brief second. Are there any thoughts or questions before I go on? A bit better. All right, so, uh, so I'll continue. So really quickly, um, A culture, let's talk about ancient cultures, when they first arose um, thousands of years ago in the various areas of, of the world. Um, the environment in which the culture arises is affected by, uh, affects the culture. So for example, um, and the adaptations of a people who live in a particular area are the roots of what becomes culture. So for example, you know, when we talk about you know, traditional Italian foods or, um, you know, specific kinds of construction of houses or, you know, traditional uh, attire or garb. Um, these arose because those were the resources that were available. You ate these foods because that's where you were. You dressed this way because those were the, 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 the you know, you, you were um, addressing the, the needs of the environment, you know, the temperature and the climate, that kind of thing. And so everything that a a culture does in a particular area is meant to make them survive that area, right? It's an, it's an environmental adaptation, the structures that we live in, the clothes that we wear, the foods that we eat. And um, 
each culture, you know, so whether you live in a rainforest or a desert or a, you know, a frozen tundra, there are, there are challenges that uh, people have to face. And so you want to be in good relationship with where you live. And um, I believe that part of the way that the gods arose in these des desperate areas is um, they're the intermediaries between uh, us and the other world, uh, and sometimes meaning the difference between life and death, right? Um, and so the, the, the landscape helps to form the culture. And the culture is responding to the landscape. It's kind of this interesting kind of a, a loop. And so uh, I think our primary relationships with the divine arose out of the needs of the land. And indeed, the first uh, divinities that we that we do see in a lot of places um, are with this idea of uh, the land spirits, right? Um, I have an example here of um, um, the Seine River in, in a lot of Celtic lands and a lot of uh, the um, European uh, areas, uh, rivers, and uh, especially in this case, are... Uh, are um, they're manifestations, they're, they're, they're divinities, and sometimes they're seen as the river, and sometimes they're seen as a separate goddess, And uh, but, but the truth is they're one and the same. And so there is this relationship with the river. The goddess is the river, and the river is the goddess. And so at the at the source of the Sen, uh, there used to be, a, a, probably before the Romans came, a Celtic shrine there, uh, but also a Roman, a, a Gallo-Roman shrine kind of arose there. Um, and it was a place of healing, and, you know, we have the... the uh, uh, the, the footprints of the of the temple complex that was there. We know that there were all of these rituals. It became an important part of the of the culture, and you can see how a river is very important to the survival of a people. Um, it's life giving. It irrigates. Uh, it's transportation. It's communication. Um, but it can flood and it can um, dry up. So it, it, rivers are both life and death. Right there is that kind of give and take energy, and so um, this relationship with the river, or if you're a sea bearing, pe uh, faring people, a relationship with the ocean, or the relationship with the ground. If you're an agricultural people, or if you're a nomadic people, your relationship with the sky, uh, because you need to bring your gods with you. Um, there are all these adaptations for survival. How do you know? We want to make it through the winter. We want to have a bountiful harvest. We want to, um, you know. Uh, experience, you know, lots of childbirth, um, all of these things. So their relationships, and then it's, it, it's, um, and, and from those relationships comes the divine. Uh, the term apotheosis is the idea that um, an energy, energy rises and it hits a place where it takes on divine attributes. It connects with divinity. And this is how I kind of look at the divine. So I think in general, I'm, I consider myself and you don't necessarily have to, um, a pantheist. Like I think that all things are part of the divine. And then in particular places, uh, when we have these relationships with these areas, uh, and, um, like the goddesses of the river, that relationship eventually, because so many people feed into those, uh, into that belief system, it creates a cultural container that holds a portion of the divine that is of like energy to it. So it's an individual, uh, you know, we talk about sometimes the difference between hard uh, polytheism and soft polytheism. Um, probably don't have time to get into that, but just the idea that um, the cultures create the container and the divinity fills that container because so many people, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of like um, uh, an X factor that differentiates something between uh, something that has spirit and then something that takes on a divine energy. And I think that that process is speeded up uh, in modern times because um, that critical mass is reached quicker because of things like the internet and the printing press and etc. So relationship becomes divinities and every culture's divinities are going to look like um, and be uh, influenced by the challenges of their landscapes. So really quickly, um, I, I have a really quick example of this. Uh, so here we have, this is uh, the ancient Near East, and you can see, I don't think you can see my pointer now, but uh, if you look uh, on the bottom center, you can see the, the, the Nile River and the, the, you know, the Delta the, in the north. And then if you look over to the right, you see the Fertile Crescent, and uh, there's, uh, it's Mesopotamia, and there are two rivers there, the Tigris and the Euphrates. So there are two um, cultural groups that kind of arose you know, mostly um, 
uh, contemporary with each other. Um, but they couldn't be more different, even though they kind of occupy that same area of, uh, of the world. So why is that? So really briefly, it's, it's just a, a really great example of how this environment switches the culture. So the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers are very... Um, well, let's talk about Egypt first, and I'll make the contrast the other way. All right. So Egypt, uh, the the, um, the cycles of Egypt are related to the cycles of the Nile. And the Nile very regularly and uh, dependably um, floods every year, I think in September. And so that, um, that experience of people who live along the Nile River is that uh, the universe is orderly, the universe is bountiful, the universe can be counted on. And, uh, you know, from that, you know, the singular river, um, you know, Egyptian culture is thousands of years old, all the different dynasties, pre-dynastic periods. And for the most part, if you look at the art, if you look at um, the religion, you know, those change a bit over time, but there's a uniformity of art. There is a con continuity of belief systems for the most part. Um, again, speaking in very general terms, but think about what that teaches them as a culture and their beliefs in the, in the other world and their relationship with the gods is a reflection of that. So in, e in ancient Egypt, if you lived a good life, if you were a good person, uh, and after you died and you had the proper funerary rites and you were given all the magical you know, tools that you needed and the, the book of the dead and all of that, uh, you would go before the gods and you would undergo this weighing of the heart. And the things that you did in life would um, affect how you spent the afterlife. If you lived in ma'at, if you lived in balance, and if your heart was lighter than the feather, then you experienced eternal joy, went to live in the field of reeds, and uh, lived among the gods uh, in, in a happy existence. So what you did affected the afterlife. And that was kind of a promise. Um, and so their relationship with their gods was that they could um, be helpful. They were, they were, um, it was a positive experience of life, because that's what their environment taught them. Excuse me. However, in Sumeria, and in, in, in Mesopotamia, there are a lot of cultures that arose in those areas, kind of um, one after another, uh, concurrent with each other. There were city-states. Uh, they were constantly fighting against each other. And um, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers were not the constants that the Nile River was. Sometimes it flooded. Sometimes uh, there were droughts. So people were not sure. Their, their environment was not stable, whether it's from war, whether it, which may arise from, you know, seeking resources, right? Whether it's from the rivers, right? you know, they lived in what would otherwise be, uh, you know, not so fertile land. So they lived a very precarious life and their relationship with their gods kind of reflected that. So here, here are these Sumerian votive statues and they found them in, um, they find them in temples. And what they are is they're uh, kind of, um, they're kind of the agents of people. People would pay to have these put in the temples. And they were, um, if you look at them, th their hands are clasped, their eyes are open wide. They're constantly in a, in a position of supplication, asking the gods, begging the gods to grant them. Some of them have like writing on them uh, of particular prayers, but there's the idea that these things are the stand-ins of the people who put them there, or even, um, you know, people who have passed. And so, um, so there's a sense that the, the universe, the world around me is fickle. Uh, I need the really need the gods to help me. And I don't know that even that they will. And so their afterlife beliefs are that, um, you know, uh, your spirit will exist afterwards if it's fed. Uh, it's up to your living relatives to feed your spirit because um, the food in the afterworld is awful. Um, there is kind of a judgment, but the judgment that happens is not based on wh what you did, but who you were. So it was a very social, uh, socially hierarchical society. And so if you were a king, if you were a judge, if you were a priest, you could probably continue doing that in the afterlife. Um, but if you were just a poor, you know, Joe six pack or whatever the equivalent in uh, Mesopotamia would have been, um, you just lived kind of in this like middle place of, you know, not such a great existence. And uh, hopefully your uh, descendants would, um, would feed you through offerings and through these magical practices. Otherwise, you would just, uh, you know, have this non-existence. And the only way that you could um, have the better existence if you weren't already a king or a priest was to be to mark yourself in some way by becoming a hero. Um, so it was a very interesting 
you know, the, the contrast between the two is very, uh, is very revealing. And this is just, you know, again, very broadly speaking, but it goes to show you that um, where people live and the experiences of their environment, and environment is not just the, the climate, you know, and, and the terrain. Environment can also be situational, right? Um, is there a plague? Is there war? Is there conquest? Is there um, drought? You know, people who live through those things or, you know, experience them a lot. That, that, is, that, is, a, that is a cultural, you know, or an environmental uh, challenge that needs to be overcome. And so these uh, experiences not only shaped uh, um, their concepts of the gods, but also their relationships with them and their sense of um, uh, their, their cosmology, like what the world is like, what the universe is like. On one hand, in Egypt, it's um, it's methodical, it's reliable, it's um, it's just right. Uh, uh, and on the other hand, it, it, it's it's chaotic, it's 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 fickle, it's unpredictable. And then the gods kind of reflect those things as well. And so their relationships with their gods and their relationships with the world around them are uh, formed by the land that they live in the, in the, in, in the situations where they are. And so um, knowing this, if you're drawn to work with ISIS, if you're drawn to work with, um, with, with, um, uh, well, uh, and Anna, um, they are products. They are the containers that are created to meet the need of their cultures that birth them. And working with them from a today practitioner's perspective is understanding that background helps us to understand the gods. And understanding the gods helps us to, you know, emulate the approach that the people who worship them in the past also took. And so um, I, I think these are all important pieces to keep in mind uh, when you're approaching divinities. And also this idea, I think, that... Um, I think it's the next, yes. Um, and we talk about this a lot in, in paganism. I know I'm just kind of going through, but there'll be some time for questions at the end. Um, you know, are we chosen by a God or do we choose them? And I think sometimes people feel like they are uh, they are called. Um, maybe they keep seeing a totem animal over and over again. Maybe they show up uh, in, in journey work that they're doing and then they identify them afterwards. Or maybe, you know... Um, there can be many, they appear in dreams. Um, so, so that's one experience. And then other experiences are, um, I read a myth and, and it really spoke to me, or, you know, I like that uh, this God is uh, the patron of the arts and I'm an artist and I and, and I'm feel drawn to that. There are a lot of different ways that we, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, in, in the ancient world, you would, you would worship the gods of your people, you would worship the gods of your land. Uh, it, we're in a place where we kind of have this sh smorgasbord, I think, um, you know, obviously in places um, where there is native traditions um, and, and you have access to them, which not everyone does where they live, um, you know, you, you can still tie in in that same way. But like someone here, let's say in the United States, uh, who doesn't live uh, on the lands where their heritage is from, not that heritage is everything. But um, anyway, you, you kind of feel like, oh, you know, the world is my oyster, which, which god or goddess am I going to work with? And I think part of the way to, you know, distinguish that is, you know, to get a sense of their myths, to spend some time engaging with that. Uh, what stories arise to you? What, you know, what symbols do you see over and over again? These are clues that get us um, where we need to be. Wow, this is going faster than I thought. So I'm sorry that I'm speaking um, quickly. But um, so I hope that makes sense in terms of um, in terms of that uh, environmental uh, adaptation piece, and I think that the gods that we feel drawn to, or that perhaps we feel are drawing us to them, um, are a reflection of our internal landscapes as well. And I think that's an important piece. Um, in, in my tradition, we do a lot of work with um, personal growth. We do a lot of work with shadow work. We work, we think it's really important to understand and know ourselves as part of building discernment, part of building trust. I think any relationship with divinity requires us to have a sense of, um, you know, being able to differentiate their voice from our voice. Um, and uh, and I think that's a foundational piece of a relationship. And, and if you're not sure about that, if you go to visit them in journey or use other um, uh, other ways of connecting, you can set things up with them and say, all right, um, uh, you know, to, so that I'm sure that what I receive, the message I receive from you is, uh, is from you. Uh, perhaps the, um, you know, to ask, allow me to see a crow in within the next 24 hours uh, as a way of validation. And then you begin to 
and if you see that crow, you're like, oh, okay, I know what that feeling is like. I know how it felt in ritual last night. I'm beginning to understand and discern the presence of the divine. I know the difference between when the crow shows up and when the crow doesn't. So that's just one way of, of, uh, of connecting. Um, so when you want to approach a divinity, uh, so be prepared, you know, know their symbols, know their attributes. If you're lucky enough to be working in a tradition like uh, Greece and Rome and, you know, Egypt or you know, Mesopotamia, you know, things that where the actual pagan people wrote things down on like the Celtic traditions where that isn't the case, then, you know, make use of those prayers, make use of those rituals, uh, read them. It's, it's, it's a huge, huge piece of, uh, of devotional work to be able to speak the words that our spiritual ancestors spoke to them. You know, the, these are established practices and, and rites and rituals. And, you know, why build a bridge from scratch when there's one that's already there that you can, you know, renew a connection with. And again, it's a devotional act. Engaging with myth, stories that speak to you. Uh, one of the things that I like to do in my practice when I'm first encountering or working with a divinity uh, is to enter into their myth, um, you know, interact with the energies, you know, um, view it. Or um, look at your, you know, like, let's say um, the second branch of the Mabinagi. Um, use my active imagination as Bronwyn to experience the things that happen in her myth. And then uh, maybe as her, as her husband who abused her, experience his piece of the myth. You know, get a sense of, of these stories and see the resonances within us. You know, what are the challenges that are, that are um, being expressed here? What, 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 are, what are the teachings? What's the metaphor here? Because that's part of them. Myths can give us a map to connection with the divine, uh, to create ritual, to look at the pieces of, of, of a tale as a metaphor for personal process. I think it's a very important um, uh, piece in a way of connecting, especially when there aren't, you know, if you're working with a divinity that doesn't have, you know, written um, uh, devotional pieces. Um, and then take all of those pieces and establish a shrine or sacred space. Um, you know, there's ritual work that you can do uh, in a formal ma fashion, but also have shrines to the divine. Work with them every day. Spend some time, you know, light some incense, put an offering there, you know, breathe, do a chant, you know, keep them in your mind, keep them in your consciousness that, you know, actively builds a bridge every day. And it's a very simple thing to do. Um, Seeking out a medium for connection or communication. If you are working in a tradition where there are ways that the ancients said you can work with the gods, they have magical principles and tools, make use of those. If you aren't, um, find find journeying tools, find uh, ways of, uh, of connecting through, you know, you can use... Um, uh, divinatory tools to connect with the divine, uh, build those relationship, um, you know, journey work into their sacred space, do some meditations on their symbols, on their images, um, embodiment work. I do um, in my Huronian book, I talk about uh, trans postures using, uh, you know, ancient artifacts and, you know, they're very deliberate in how the gods are depicted and spending time with a drumming track in the background holding the posture of the divinity with the intention of connecting with them is a really powerful way of, of creating that bridge of connection. Um, approach them with respect and an open heart, you know, uh, Anytime I work any with with, with, a, with a deity or a, a spirit of place, or if I'm in a new landscape, um, I, I want to make a connection, and I want to you leave space for you know maybe it's not the right time to work with this divinity, maybe it's not the right time, maybe this isn't the right place for me to do this ritual. To be open to that yes or to that no. Um, and then, you know, again, the respect for the culture is really important as well. Um, bringing in as many of those pieces as we can um, is both, again, an honoring to them. It's a respect for the culture and it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it, it's a resonance, like just a purely magical principle of like attracting life. Like, um, again, in devotional relationships, it's, it's like a, a asking for guidance. You're not necessarily asking for them to, to do things for you. Well, you can, I guess. But uh, for me, it's more about being in relationship, having them help me be the best person that I am so I can be in better service. Um, again, offering gifts with that expectation. I'm not saying I'm going to give you this mead if you give me this, you know, thing that I want. Um, it's, I love you. I appreciate you. I honor you. I respect you. And here is, here is an offering for you with, without any, um, any, any strings attached. And all of these things are about building that bridge and reinforcing those connections, investing time and energy into the, into that process. So 
again, generally speaking, study, meeting the gods where they are. If there are myths, if there are rituals, if there are rites, learn them, find them, speak them, sing them. Uh, if you're not a big researcher, if you're not a big reader, there are beautiful videos on YouTube. Uh, people give courses. Um, you know, there's so much information that's accessible that, uh, you know, really just... Um, get into the, the primary sources, read the core myths instead of other people's interpretations of them. I mean, for this piece, I would stay, you know, stay, stay with, the, with, the, with the, the writers and the authors that are talking about like the core material as opposed to, uh, you know, a, a modern interpretation of them. Um, if there's a religious calendar that's inherent in that culture, use it, right? Uh, it never made sense to me to, you know, invoke Isis and Osiris at Samhain, because uh, the agricultural cycle of the British Isles in Ireland is not the same as the one in, 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 um, in Egypt. And, um, you know, it's kind of like putting a square peg in a round hole. If they, they have their own religious calendar, if there's a particular feast for the divinity that you want to be in relationship with, uh, celebrate that feast, find out the kinds of offerings, you know, use the cultural piece, that cultural tool right? Um, devotional art, you know, statuary, things that you create yourself. These are visual cues that help you to connect. And, and I talked about the transposture piece. Uh, visiting sacred sites, if it's possible, if you live in the landscape where, you know, the gods, um, you know, myths come to reside, or if you can go there in pilgrimage. But even if you can't, looking at photographs, pictures, um, connecting with uh, stones or oil uh, or waters that people have brought back is a, is a powerful way to connect with these divinities. Um, Research their cult centers. You know, I, I talked about that um, that healing the healing shrine at the um, at, you know the springs of the Sen. Um, based on what the temple looks like, we have a sense of, or if you've ever gone through, you know, the 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 temple at Bath, the different rooms and the different things that happen there. You know, the rituals. Um, you know, we get a sense even from the archaeological. Uh, uh, information alone of what happened in some of these places and trying to emulate that. You know, uh, let's say Bridget has associations with, you know, healing wells. And so what are the practices that people in Ireland do around these healing wells? How can you integrate that in your work wherever you are in the world? Um, uh, you know, emulate those practices and, uh, you know, perform those rites and rituals, meet them where they are, instead of having them come over here uh, during a time of the year in, in a ritual format that is alien to them. Because um, it's, it's, it's not that you can't make that connection, but the idea of like attracts like is that it's easier to make that connection. You're walking a, a well-worn path as opposed to, you know, using a machete uh, to chop down uh, a new way. All right, just for quickness, I'm going to go through. Um, this, it always goes faster than you think. Um, I, I kind of, I guess I've already uh, talked about all of these pieces. So that's practice. And and just one thing about practice, you know, if if there are cultural practices that are available, uh, at, you know, from, from manuscripts and things like that, or, you know, that you've learned from uh, Native teachers, um, are invited to use them, right? Um, do so. But if they don't exist, you can use Western traditional, you know, different kinds of, uh, you know, a journey work and uh, things of that nature uh, to, to create this connection. And then once you have a stable connection or, or a, a certain connection, a rooted connection with the divinity, you can ask them, what can I do better? What can I do different? What's a better way to connect with you? What what offerings do you prefer? Um, and, and so you use the, the, gen the general tool until you can find a more specific tool or or fix that general tool in a way that is more specific to them. And then that devotional piece, uh, and I kind of talked about that, that relationship through acts of creation. So creating a shrine, creating a, 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 a statue, creating incense, creating a, a ritual robe, a garment that is connected to them, that is culturally connected. Um, uh, creating chants, creating a liturgy that is connected to them. These are devotional things, especially if you share them with other people. But I would say when you do those things, when you share, um, always differentiate the difference between this is an ancient practice and this is something that is uh, that is that comes from my inspiration, right? So this is ancient, this is new. Um, acts of sacrifice. Now I'm not asking you to go sacrifice animals or people or any of the things, but giving offerings um, is, is a powerful way of making connection. Uh, making making things, um, you know, 
as a gift to the divine. Uh, and you can do that daily, as I said, on your shrine. And then acts of service. You know, not every devotional relationship means that you're going to come into service as a priest or a priestess um, or an intermediary for other people or connecting them with other people. But you can still be giving service, as I said, like uh, through volunteering, uh, um, through, you know, if, if you're working with a god who's a psychopomp, perhaps becoming a, um, a death doula is, 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 a, is a way of being in service to them that, that makes sense and that reinforces your connection to them. And I think all three of these things together, practice, study, practice, and devotion are the keys that get us into relationship. And especially when we pull that cultural piece in, it just makes it so much easier because again, we are walking a path well connected. And that's just my information. If you want to contact me uh, and the books that I've written, just uh, to get that piece out of the way. And I do in our, the short time that we have, I know we have a minute. Are there any questions? And I'm sorry, it's a, it's a big piece. How would you argue against people accusing you of deity or a religious appropriation? Um, again, I think that we have to do our due process around those things, especially if they're living uh, culture. So I work in a, in a Welsh tradition and um, it's, it is my practice to uh, listen to, work with, learn from Native practitioners. I got my master's degree in Celtic studies from the University of Wales as part of my immersion in that culture. I don't live there. I don't speak the language, but lang learning the language is a great way. I think, I think as long as there are, um, as, as we're clear about um, what is traditional and what is, what we talk, call right the UPGPs, as long as we uh, uh, seek to be respectful, as long as we seek to honor these sources, as long as we seek to engage in culture in a way that is not appropriative, that we're not, you know, um, creating something new or uh, ripping off things or, you know, seeking to work with gods in traditions that are close to us. Uh, I think that, um, you know, that's that's the process uh, that that is most helpful. But always, I think always listening to native voices is important. So, yeah, that was long. Yeah, great point. Relationship to general connection rather than quid pro quo. Yeah, exactly. And so then I, I, this is what I think. Over the years, again, because I, I've been blessed to be in these relationships, you know, I, I feel like I can turn to them as, uh, you know, a, as a resource in my times of trouble, as, 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 some, as, as, as a, a, a to, to receive guidance to move me to the next step. Um, and uh, and I'm, not, um, I'm not putting upon, uh, putting anything upon anyone else. Um, so, so yes, so I encourage you uh, to connect with me if you have any questions. I'm sorry that it's uh, quick. Uh, I know that there's a comment space below here on Facebook and also on, on YouTube. So I'll, I'll check back there if anyone didn't get to ask a question. And, um, and I really appreciate your um, attention today and uh, enjoy the rest of MoonCon 22. Thank you so much, everyone.